again. Uh, it's now uh, 11pm 11, 11 Saturday night here in Australia and we've got Miles Hale. Um, now Miles' layout is spectacular, I can say that. I, I actually went there when I went to the convention in uh, Kansas City uh, a couple of years back. It seems like an eternity back now but it was only a couple of years ago. And uh, yes, I ended up taking three trips out to Miles's place. Not only does he get a spectacular Owen 30 layout inside, but there's a big G gauge layout outside, plus a ride on railway that you can uh, go around the backyard. So, yeah, a lot of fun was had, and it's great to see you again, Miles. So, um, I'll hand it over to you, and uh, you can entertain the masses. Well, I want to thank you for, for putting all this together. I, you, as you may know, I came down to Australia uh, for your narrow gauge convention about four years ago, and I had an absolutely fantastic time. Great area, great area around you, and uh, it was great. Had a good time. Excellent. At any rate, um, I, um, I started this railroad in ON30. Uh, I used to be in ON3 for almost... <laughs> I guess 40 years, um, and always wanted to model Colorado, uh, Colorado nail gauge. And so the first question you probably would ask is why did I change to ON30 and why am I sitting in the middle of the big city? Well, my best friend, John Lawrence, who's down in San Antonio, is going to do the next hour uh, clinic with me on, on signage. Um, he always had a saying that I was modeling the canyons of Colorado while he was modeling the canyons of New York. His railroad was called the New York, New London and Western. It was a fictitious railroad running out north, uh, east of New York. Anyway, so I, that saying always kind of stuck in my mind. And when I moved back here to Kansas City, I moved away right after I graduated high school and went to college. And um, when I came back, of course, the city had changed dramatically. But one thing that they did not change was the bottoms area of Kansas City. The city that's down by the Missouri River, uh, where it comes down from the north and then suddenly turns and goes runs actually from west to east, headed for St. Louis. And that whole area is a river bottom area that's many miles wide, and it is filled with buildings like the ones behind me here um, that are still there. It's a little microcosm of history from the uh, turn of the century all the way up to. Well, now, of course, because they're preserved, but most of those buildings were built from 1900 probably to around 1940 or so. Um, so I wanted to model my home city. And I know that they never had any 30-inch uh, or probably never had any 3-inch running in town that I know of. Um, excuse me, 3-foot um, railroad running here in town. But nonetheless, I made the switch to ON30 because Gil Freitag, who I've always considered to be an expert and a genius in model railroading. Uh, he and John Armstrong, I think, are really four, four thinking individuals in the terms of model railroaders. And Gil's thing was that he had a whole bunch of brass engines out on his railroad down in Houston, Texas. And he had operators coming over every week. And he was running the journals literally out of those brass engines. Well, at that time, and this has been 30 years ago, 35 years ago, uh, um, that was ruining a $300 engine every every time those journals would go out. So he changed to ON30. He bought a whole bunch of the Stewart F7s, which were some of the forerunners of the HO uh, engines that came out. And I thought, wow, that, that's kind of interesting. About that same time, Bachman, well, not that same time, about 15 years ago, I guess, Bachman became extremely popular in ON30. And that was just before I moved back here to town. I've been here back, back home about 10 years. Um, and I thought, well, you know, that's kind of silly for me to put out ON3 engines that were, were at that time running anywhere from $500 to $1,000. And I can put a, a Bachman engine on here for 100 or less and accomplish the same thing because I just want to move cars from my operating crews. I actually wound up, I have a whole lot of S-scale equipment here on the railroad, both rolling stock and engines. I have a bunch of... Um, uh, S helper, SW9s is one right beside me right now. Um, I have some other engines that I picked up along the way that are full O scale. Um, but I'll kind of show them if we have some time as we go around. 
So anyway, that's kind of the history. I wanted to model my hometown, and that's what I have. Uh, Stewart Hall is one of the uh, buildings that's down in uh, more or less the bottoms area. All the buildings here are either from the bottoms of Kansas City or from the Kansas City downtown area. And um, this is another scene over here. This is the built building that I've been doing a bunch on my website with. And it is the Kansas City Stockyards building. If you've been watching my YouTube channel at Model Railroad University or Model Railroad University, uh, you've seen me working on this building. It is almost six feet long. And um, it, uh, it has about 600 windows or will have it in. You can see here, I've got another couple hundred windows to cut on this wall and another 50 or 60 on every one of the other subsidiary walls around the way. But I've been talking about how to treat windows and all that kind of stuff. I have the Golden Ox Steakhouse down here. And that actually is a restaurant, a steak restaurant uh, that was in the bottoms in the Kansas City Stockyards building uh, from its inception back in 1900, whatever. And my front entry here uh, for the um, model was copied from the actual building itself. This section is 3D printed, as are the bricks, as is all of the, uh, as are? I think it's R. As are all of the windows. Here they're all, everything is 3D printed. However, this material is Centra, and I'll talk about how I got to, to using it along the way. The medallions are all 3D printed. The cornice up here is all 3D printed. Um, everything's 3D printed. But what I want to do is um, you can see that entryway there that's 3D printed. I want to walk you into the building. So what I have here is this little guy. And we'll go inside. The statue is of the Wrangler that used to work in the stockyards. Uh, he's kind of half broken down horse. And uh, he's had a hard day. And that's the monument that is actually in the lobby of the building itself. This, of course, is the model. Um, if you're wondering how I did that photograph, um, I have a new lens, which if we have time and somebody asks about it, I'll show you it. But it's absolutely fantastic. That whole shot was done without any helicon focus or anything else. It was all strictly worked by the lens itself, which is absolutely a phenomenal lens. Um, I do want to turn the camera here. I'll do one thing. I'll give you a shot over at the other building while I turn cameras so you're not dizzy by what I'm doing here, hopefully. Because there's a couple of things I want to do if I can get the camera to cooperate with me. And it's tight. There we go. Okay, that's not too dark. Put you back up on that camera. Oops. That camera. There we go. So this is the stockyards, um, what was called the Hog Hotel. Hogs cannot um, sweat. So I'll get my camera locked down here. Cameras can, or, uh, hogs cannot sweat. Cameras can't sweat either. Hogs can't sweat. So what they did was they built this concrete structure. And this is all laser cut wood um, so that I got precision alignment on all of the uprights. Then all of the railing here on the front and all of the fences inside were all 3D printed. Um, there's some uh, about 200 fences in here. Um, and then of course this was printed in about eight inch sections and then glued together for the outer, outer railing. And then everything scenic. And this is some of my 200 or so windows up above here. Let's tilt you up a little bit. You can see that some of the windows I don't have. The window treatments in here, obviously, this is just the background that you're looking at, the gator board that I use as, a, as an underlayment. This is the um, cornice that goes up at the top. Um, this is the way I was making it. And this actually has um, several sections here that are printed about five inches at a time. And then I printed my lower piece the same way. Every one of these corbels is individually printed. 
and then every one of the squares here was individually printed. And that way it didn't really work too well because I don't think you can tell here, but after a while, because of the glue that I was using, which was um, Weld on 4, I love Weld on 4 and Weld on 3. For some reason or other, it seemed to attack this plastic, and I got a warpage. This is actually bowed. Um, so I've gone to, and I know people are going to criticize me for this, but I don't care. They make good products. I don't work for them anymore, but I did it one time, and that's Woodland Scenics. And Woodland Scenics makes their uh, hobby tack glue, which is actually a latex glue. Um, so there's no solvents or no active agents in it. But anyway, I've come back and I've redone these now so that this piece prints all in one piece. And my background, which I have down in here, hopefully we can pull one out. My background slips on there. And there's my piece all done. So I can literally glue this on and then apply glue to this and glue this on the front. And that will go then, let's tilt the camera up a little bit. That will go up here because that cornice continues all the way along this entire section. So I keep parts that are going to buildings. Um, I keep them underneath the railroad in the section that they're in. So this shoe box with all the uh, cornice in it goes right below the Kansas City Stockyards that's going into. Next thing I have over here, and I goofed up, I should have had the There we go. I'll give you that view, but I'm going to give you a little video on this thing. Well, I should have had this turned on for you ahead of time, but I didn't, of course. So there's that guy, and he's on, so I'll turn that off. Hopefully, my camera will pick it up. It's, uh, maybe not. Why am I not picking it up? All right, we'll turn the lights back on. I'm sure that camera will be open enough to do it. Okay. Well, anyway, sorry. It's narrow aisles to here, so I'm going to bump you a little bit. Okay, so that's the Western Auto, and I'll see if I can't bring up a graphic here for you to watch. Sorry, it takes you a minute to bring things up here. There we go. Oh, come on. Okay. There's the sign as I had it. And we'll play that and it'll go, hopefully. The Western Auto sign when it was first uh, put on top of the building in actually downtown Kansas City um, had a sequencing to it where the arrow would build, arrow would go off, and then the arrow would come on, and each letter would go individually. Everything off, everything on, and then it starts again. So um, one thing that I wanted to do was to duplicate that sequencing. And that took a little bit of doing because nowadays, now that they've adjusted and changed the um, sign, they, they actually refurbished it, thank goodness they brought it back to life. But in doing so, um, they actually made the thing solid so that the uh, Western Auto are in neon and they're on all the time. And you don't have any um, sequencing to it other than the arrow itself builds. So I want to build it back to the original form. And the only way I could figure out to do that was with relays. Uh, I'm not an Adreno guy. I haven't uh, gone in, you'll see as we go along here, it's a little dark. Let's get this thing a little lighter. Um, as we've gone along here, I have uh, about 50 million projects, and uh, one of them is uh, I have not taken time to learn how to program an Arduino yet. So I have to make do with what I have, and what I have is some knowledge of relay. So again, I went back to my 3D printer. I love that thing. It's a Prusa, by the way. Um, and I just got a Prusa Mini, so I have two of them now, but one larger, one smaller. I printed discs, and they had tabs on. They were cams, off-center cams. And those cams activate a micro switch. And each one of those segments of the sign, let's do it again for you as we talk about it here. 
Uh, if I can find it, there we go. Uh, open. There we go. As each one of those segments goes, that is a micro switch being triggered by a separate disc. So I think I have something like 27 or so discs um, on that reel rod and uh, a micro switch below each one of those discs that turns the sign uh, so that it works. So at any rate, little mechanical uh, work, which is actually, ironically, how the real sign actually worked. Um, I want to take you around some of the rest of the railroad, and so I'm going to change plugs out here in a second, but I'll give you camera four to look at here real quick. It's kind of neat. Hope we didn't lose everything. Nope. Um, i got to find my other camera plug. There we go. So what you're looking at now is the Western Auto Building from the other side, the, um, what I would call the, the front side, actually, of the real building. How did I lose that? There we go. Sorry, I keep tracking my plugs. Okay. So that's the back side of the building. Um, and the Western Auto Building is on, I believe, your left. My picture's reversed. The yard that I use is on um, your right. And uh, I have a whole string of Woodland Scenics um, and Menards buildings. Let me pick you up here and move. And I have a whole street re represented here, all the way from Western Auto, all the way down here. Um, most of those are lit. Um, unfortunately, I don't think my cameras are opening up enough to show it, but we'll see here in a minute. I'll see if I can get it for you. I don't know why it didn't show up before. We'll try it one more time and turn the lights off. Because <laughs> it really is, I think, one of the key elements to having a railroad that's a city is that you have the ability, but it's just not going to show up, is it? Because you have the ability to get that glow of the city. And so, yeah, it's just not going to do it. My cameras don't open up enough to show what's going on. But at any rate, trust me, in the room, there's a whole glow from the city. And as I add more and more buildings, I add, try to add lights absolutely everywhere. Um, just to enhance that feeling, and the, the glow of the city. I used to come back from college. I went down in Enid, Oklahoma, to a little school that's now bankrupt called Phillips. And uh, let's see which camera I got on. Yep, this one, okay. Um, as I would come back, I would see this ambiance of the city lights hitting the sky. And it was just kind of neat to somebody coming home that had been gone for a while. Um, I want to do one other thing, so let me turn up. Another camera here, and I'll show you another feature of the railroad that a lot of people tend to talk about, and you probably need to take a look at. Get this camera turned around again, hopefully. My apologies, I'm having. This is Murphy's Law. The railroad's working well, but the cameras are giving me a hard time. In this case, it was a tripod. Okay, let's turn this guy around. I hope I have a wide enough shot here to show you. Here we go. And Okay. So, here's my entryway. I had gone to a great deal of work, and I'll talk about this in a second. I promised a minute ago. This is my background buildings. And the only thing that destroys the illusion here in the railroad is this doorway, because I have those buildings, as I'll show you in a minute, all the way around here. You are literally in the bottoms when you come in here. But <clears throat> I had this pull-down um, shelf here, <clears throat> which allows, is my camera off? Say again.
Are we okay? It's showing. Oh, here. There we go. Okay. Now, how we get it? Okay. So I have this doorway here, <clears throat> and I have all these buildings that go all the way around the room on both sides. And I had to have some way to. Well, th this destroyed the illusion that I wanted that you were in the in the bottoms. So being a model maker, I made a model of this. Here's my, oh, this is my grain elevator that you see over there on the right. This is my door. These are my buildings over here, my layout. And what I decided was this represents my fold down here. If I took a fence and put it on the sliding bar here, I could move that grain elevator and hide my door. So if you watch, because this happens pretty quick, as I let this down, you can see my fence here pulling that. And when it drops into place, we have city now all the way 360 around the room. And I have the ability here, I actually have a switch on the turnout, which works very well, by the way. Um, here, that is part of my Y, so I can turn cars here on this thing. My track at the back is my runaround track that goes all the way around. There is a closet door hanger, one of the sliding door hangers. It's mounted on the wall over here, just behind my other elevator, so you can't see it. And part of it then, of course, is on this uh, elevator, which allows it to slide. It is totally free hanging up here. So the center actually supports itself. It's about an eighth of an inch thick, and it's actually pretty stiff. Um, and my mechanism here, the fence is attached on this end to a bracket on the back side, And on the other end here, it's attached to the bottom of this grain elevator. So as it moves, it shows that uh, center print of that grain elevator back out of the way. Um, while we're talking about center, I'll talk about how I got to that. This is a paper uh, print of a building, again, from Kansas City. It's put on a piece of gator board, and this is how I started to make a lot of the buildings that you see around here on the background. The problem with this, this one has done really pretty well. If you feel it, it does have some uh, ripple to it. Paper doesn't do too well, uh, even when it's sealed very, very well. And I wasn't very happy with it. Um, so a friend of mine who happened to own an advertising agency, happened to be the agency for the Chiefs at the time. Chiefs are the world champions right away. Uh, just had to stick that in. Uh, the... Uh, he said, well, why don't you go down and talk to Tom? Because Tom down at Heartland Graphics, he'll print all this stuff on Centra. It was the best suggestion that I've had in this railroad. It was an absolutely fantastic idea. The uh, Western Auto Building that you see over here to the right. I'll try and move if I can get this tripod to hold up and quit collapsing on me. What my problem is here. Sorry. My tripod is trying to collapse, and I cannot seem to keep it solid. I'll tighten them up a little more. At any rate, now if you can see the um, Western Auto Building, let this thing down so we can get a better view. Uh, the Western Auto Building actually wraps around, and I built a wooden frame that was actually curved. And it duplicates the Western Auto Building the way it actually sets. Uh, it is a circular building. And the tracks did follow it. Um, this is, I can't change the focal length on this lens, so we'll just drop down a bit. There we go. You see the tracks coming around. If I get this building out of the way, it'll look a little bit better. And uh, so anyway, I want to talk a little bit about building construction. Um, first of all, that horse statue that you saw. Wow, that's white. I don't know if you're going to be able to see that or not. Darken that down a bunch. There we go. Um, if you can see it or not, but that's, that's how the horse started off. Uh, it was a roper. You notice the cowboy's got his hand up and around the rope, and the horse is the thoroughbred. I found that on 3D prints, you can take a soldering iron 
And if you heat it, uh, you can actually play sculptor with it and it will actually change um, the shape of it. I'll back up a little bit here. This is the main aisle where you first come in, so there's a lot of stuff here. This was a building that Laurel Joyner built and had in the NMRE Boston, I believe, years and years ago. This building is kind of unique because it's only an inch thick. That loading dock is the total thickness of the building. Those dock doors are against the wall that's on the other side of the building. So you can see here, I've got a track that comes in here, actually here, and a track over here. And these two tracks are only about four inches apart. You can't tell it in real life because this big end of the building comes in and this track goes underneath. And on the other end, of course, uh, the track comes in and dies and there's another uh, chunk of building on this end. So if you're looking from this end, it looks good. If you're looking from this end, it looks good. It looks full thickness um, and not foreshortened. I'm also going to do a feature that was in the bottoms. Sorry for the swing. And that's, they had all kinds of what I call crossovers. Buildings had places where you could go from one building to another. And I have a track running back in there behind for switching. Um, lock that down again. We'll go talk about something else. Um, there, I got some notes here. Keep me on, on track. I started off with the standard construction, what I would call standard construction, uh, contest construction. That's how the uh, Sunshine building that I just showed you was done. Sunshine Biscuit was actually located here in Kansas City. And uh, then I discovered Chooch, Michael O'Connell, who owns Chooch. He started making these beautiful uh, three, uh, 3D printed, well, actually they were laser cut. He would cut these on the laser I don't know why this has gone dark on me again, so we'll lighten it up. There we go. Um, he would cut these out, individual pieces on the laser, glue them up, then make a mold out of them, um, and cast these. And so I have several of these out on buildings on the fronts, because that's all he sold was the fronts. And then I've used the center brick uh, around the rest of the building. That's my evolved method of making and once i did that then i decided well i could take the bricks on centra and i'll cut the windows out which is what i did on the kansas city stockyards building the problem there as you probably heard earlier is that i have 600 some odd windows to cut and to me that's a lot of work and that's a monumental task that i really uh, didn't want to try to tackle I really would rather have them uh, pre-printed like they were on the Western Auto Building. I'll spin you around here and show you another piece of the background and how much more we can do if everything is pre-printed. So hopefully that changed. It did, good. Uh, all of this is pre-printed. And the advantage here is that once I have it in Photoshop, then I can come in here. If I, I did not change these names. They are names of actual uh, businesses because these are actual photographs of the businesses in the bottoms. <coughs> Excuse me. But you can see that the brick detail comes through on these. So let me walk over here for a second. I'll leave you on that view so you don't see me messing around here. But there's a couple of them that I have done that uh, are a little bit different. If I can get them to show up. Since the next hour is on signs, we'll talk about signs a little bit here. That is camera two, maybe? Camera one, two, yeah, it should be two. There we go, yep. So here you can see a bunch of signs that I have worked on in a bunch of buildings. And this building, use my finger to point because I can't get around there. Um, this building here, the Mueller Soap, um, I'm not sure what building that was. It is a building from the bottoms. I'm not sure it was really Morris Butt. I will tell you that Morris Butt was a real manufacturer in Kansas City 
all the names here are taken from a list of uh, businesses that were in the business directory back from anything from 1900 to 1940 because I want to label all my buildings correctly. But anyway, this building was not uh, labeled when I photographed it with that. So I went in on it, put it in in Photoshop, and then in Photoshop, you can actually change the opacity so you can see through the letters. And I did that and it allows the bricks uh, to actually show through. Same thing was done on um, Moline Plow. Changed that around so that its uh, name was changed. Casey Ice was changed. Stowe Hardware, which is behind the ice company there, that was uh, not changed. Uh, that is Stowe Hardware from Kansas City. But you can see how I can match signs by changing the opacity. I make them make, look much older than what they were. I have to show you the Woodland Seas guys came by um, at the National Convention to, and toured the railroad. Yeah, it tilts you down out of that light. <coughs> and uh, they saw that H, uh, H and H feed store, which is kind of over to your left, left center. And if you look very closely at the sign, you'll notice that it is upside down. We think there are only two of those buildings that slipped by Woodland Sinks uh, quality control. Both of the buildings exist here in Kansas City. One's at my friend's house, Larry Alfred, and one here. And the CEO of Woodland said, we got to change that. I'll send you a new one. I said, no, you're not. <laughs> I'm keeping it as a collector's item. So I keep it there. It's kind of a novelty if people notice the sign is actually upside down. Um, in the midst of all this, it's, it's kind of hard to pick out one thing that isn't maybe 100%. In the foreground, however, though, I have a building here. I think this is from MTH. Uh, I went inside and put an interior in it and raised these doors up uh, so that we have interiors in them. And I've done that with a lot of these um, Menards buildings. The green building is a Menard building. Um, I took out the lights that they had and put LED lights in just because the LED lights seem to light up much better. Same thing with the brewery. And with Sherman Williams, if you've watched John and I do our cloud clinic very often, you know that we use Sherman Williams a lot. I don't get any kickbacks from them, but man, I sure like their paint. I do do mock-ups. That's a mock-up of the um, Associated Grocers building, which was also part of the bottoms area. It's over by the Santa Fe yards. And uh, we're going to put it in eventually too. Come down here and give you a little different view. I do have a hobo uh, area, and we'll pay in for that. There's my hobos down by the tree. The card, white cards that are laying around everywhere are my operating cards I'm trying to separate for um, operation sessions right now. I have a loading dock, the um, forklift is 3D printed. Done a lot of details on 3D printing. Bursting Appleby is um, an electronics company here in town. They provide a lot of my electronics for the stuff that I use for the broadcast for Model Railroad University on YouTube. And the Kansas City skyline was shot from the Confluence Park, where the Kansas and Missouri River come together, which is on the west side of downtown Kansas City. And then I took that photograph in Photoshop and massage it a little bit. That print is almost eight feet long. It runs along the entire back of the uh, of the city. And if I move a camera here, I think, give you a little different view. Fresh boom. Oh, come on, camera. Okay, let me go switch cameras so you're on the right one. Give me a little different view of that same thing. That should be camera three, I hope. Ah, voila. Um, so this is a little bit of a scene from um, my grandmother's neighborhood that I tried to recreate here. Um, Kansas City has a lot of the stepped um, houses like this one, let me get around here and I'll get, hopefully if I can get a little cord. Yeah, there we go. Um, 
it has the step neighborhood that's kind of a, I don't know, given for some river town type neighborhoods. Doesn't have a subway. I'm sorry, I put one in because I needed it for the, the track the way it goes. I do have a cemetery off to the side over here. Um, all of the buildings there, I think you may be able to tell, have TVs in them that are glowing. I did a, a whole uh, episode on my channel on putting TVs into it because in the 50s, everybody had a flickering uh, tube type TV. My grandfather worked for SEAL Test, so that's the um, SEAL Test truck up there with the delivery guy. And uh, at any rate, it's just, uh, I thought it was just a pretty good representation of the neighborhood where I grew up. Uh, this downtown area over here is uh, a representation of just a typical kind of suburban, not so downtown area of Kansas City. And the Kansas City background, of course, back behind that. And the beautiful clouds that everybody should have on their railroad, thanks to John Lawrence and his innovative technique for using stencils. Sorry, I have to give him a plug. Uh, he is my best friend, after all. And fellow model railroader. I'm going to give you a view, a little bit different view, on another camera. I'm going to talk about some of it. Uh, I think that's right. Ah, how about that? Got the right camera. Um, tried to create again the city. Uh, if we get the operating cards out of the way, they will look a little bit better. Want a little bit of a view of downtown, kind of things moving through. Plus, the 50 Highway Motel was famous. It was out in Raytown, which is a suburb of Kansas City, out there towards the east. I actually grew up in Lee Summit, a little bit further out than Raytown, even. But uh, that's the Walters um, Highway Motel. I think they had it labeled 66 or something. But anyway, I came in on the printer and printed a Highway 50 logo because that's what the motel was actually labeled and uh, scraped off the one that was there for Walters and put the Highway 50 on. So this one uh, mimics or looks like, I hope, um, the 50 Highway Motel that I remember driving by all the time because I would have to drive along 50 Highway to get from Lee Summit into Kansas City. The uh, other project that I've been going on, I have to flip this camera to get it. This locomotive is a model of number 13 on the Kansas City Stockyards Railroad. They had their own railroad. And I'll see here if I can get this guy to, to run, and then we'll talk about systems that I use. Oh, come on, do the thing for me. Okay, there we go. He's roped. Come on, baby. He wants to move, I hope. Why did we go off? Loco 13. Come on. There we go. Okay, now we're, yeah, it took off like crazy. He will crawl. He is um, powered by a S cab battery decoder, but that engine is 100% 3D printed everything on it. The only commercial parts I used were two trucks and the motor. All the universals, all the rest of the drive system, frames, everything else, um, all 3D printed to represent the number 13, which was the switch engine for the Kansas City Stockyards. And then I had a photograph of an actual auction taking place. So you can see back here in the back is my auctioneer and some of the guys um, auctioning. They actually walked on top of the planks. You can see the two guys up there. And they had platforms on top where they put the straw or the hay so that they could drop it down into the feedlots uh, to feed the uh, cattle as they awaited um, purchase. We won't say what comes after purchase. Might be some kids watching. But at any rate, that's a representation. They actually had some 600 plus acres 
of um, pins all over uh, the stockyards area. It was a huge, huge area. Second only to Chicago. Um, so I got to change my camera. You can't see me. <laughs> Not that that's important. Let's flip it around anyway. Just in case you might want to. There we go. Um, I'm operating three different um, systems, I think. I may have to count as we go because I'm not sure. I've kind of lost track. As a part of my Railroad University, I always tried when I did my clinics at the NMRA, um, regionals and nationals, and out at other uh, jamboree type shows or whatever, I tried to have as many of the systems for operating trains as possible. Um, I used to have, I think, one of almost every DCC type system uh, that people could come up and try out. For the layout here, I settled on NCE. I think they're extremely reliable. Uh, they're usually beta tested long before they're released, which I think is absolutely fantastic. It makes it a little bit more user friendly. And since I really was a PE teacher, um, I'm really not an electronics expert. I figure everything out kind of as we go. Um, so I wanted something that was reliable and that I could understand. That NCE was my best um, choice as far as I was concerned. Then I decided, well, that's all good, but one of the big problems with any of the systems that get their power through the track is that they get through the power through the track. You have to rely on that wheel contacting that rail to get electronics or to get electrical uh, power signal, whatever's being transferred. It all comes through that wheel touching the rail. So I looked at dead rail and SCAB at the time was coming in very, very, uh, they were really coming on strong. <laughs> and I can't remember, but there was another one. I can't remember if it was Tam Valley or whatever. There was another one. I think it was Tam Valley <coughs> coming on at the time. Both of them had their attributes. attributes. Um, the SCAB reversed engineered. He took an NCE decoder, put his thing on it so that it would be a radio a receiver, made that did or that uh, NCE decoder think that it was still on the tracks when actually it was getting a radio signal from the broadcaster or the, or the controller and it powered off the battery. So you could put it on a table and it would run. It didn't need any track or any power or anything. I thought that was really a good thing. It is somewhat limited in the number of functions that you have. So Tam Valley came along and said, well, we're going to take the decoder. We're going to do somewhat the same thing, but we're going to have full functionality on the decoder. The difference came in the fact that the SCAB one had what he calls a BPS, a battery power system monitor, whatever it is. It's a little board that goes in the engine and it picks up the power from the track and it does it continually. So all you need is a few sections of your railroad powered. I already had mine totally powered because of the NCE. So my batteries continually charge themselves back up. That was a great feature for me because Tam Valley required you to either have a separate plug and a switch to switch between the locomotive control and charging. You switch it over to charge and you plug the battery into some plug that you put on the locomotive and it had to sit there and charge. Or you had to take the battery out and charge it. And to me, that was a lot of trouble. As you start to get to five to 10 engines, which I have about 10 on the railroad, once you get to that many, remembering after every operating session to take every battery out and make sure that you got every one out and that you're recharging those was a little too much for me. So the SCAB seemed to be a better choice. Then I heard about Deltang, which is out of England. And Deltang is absolutely fantastic because our decoders here in the States I think the smallest one is probably an inch by an inch by maybe a sixteenth of an inch thick or maybe a little little thicker than sixteenth. That's not bad. That's pretty small. But a Deltang decoder is smaller than your little finger uh, nail. And it's only, well, it's probably less than a sixteenth of an inch thick. It is super, super small. The problem is, of course, it doesn't have the uh, battery power supply to it and everything else. You have to figure out how to do that. So need a good hobby store with a good RC department, um, and you can use Deltang. But I have Deltang in a speeder, which unfortunately I didn't get out to bring in here. But at any rate, it, it's in a little uh, O-gauge Grantline speeder, and you can't see the decoder or the battery or anything. I've got a battery in there that's half the size of the end of my little finger, and it will run for a couple of hours 
uh, because it has so little draw on the little tiny motor. But that's another way to do it is with Delta, and I have all three of those systems uh, running at times here on the railroad. So that covers the, I think that, the only thing I didn't talk about was sound effects, and I don't know if you all have heard them, because I've had the fan on here the whole time. It's a little warm. It's been near you know, 100 plus here in Kansas City lately. This is really going to be bad to move my microphone around like this because you're probably going to hear it. But I'll try and give you. Can you hear that? Again? I hope you could. That's my pig sounds. And they are running rampant here. They go all the time. And then over here to my right where I'm walking, I have a sensor. And as you walk by that, it turns on the street sounds for this street scene that I had here in front of the Kansas City Stockyard. So I've tried to add sound effects. And sound is an interesting thing. I don't really have any locomotives that have sound in them, uh, mainly because I went to one railroad down in Oklahoma years ago. I, I imagine, unfortunately, that mile road is not with us any longer. But he had a bunch of locomotives in a rather large room, bigger than mine. And he had all of them turned up to full volume. And I was standing there thinking, wait a minute, I used to actually work for the railroad and I did after I stopped talking, after I stopped teaching. And I could not hear the engineer most of the time if I was standing down underneath him, just from the cab to the, to the ground. I was a switchman, he was the engineer. And certainly by the time I moved to the end of the engine, I could not hear him. By the same token, that engine was so loud, but by the same token, if I got a block away from work driving home, even with the windows open on a quiet summer night, I couldn't hear the engines. <coughs> so if you stop and think what a, a block is in terms of distance and your scale, how can you hear engines across an entire room? It, it just doesn't make sense. So I don't use locomotives with sound. Uh, I do have ambient sound in the room, and those hogs and those cows are mooing and, you know, doing their thing constantly. It's white noise. But I want it that way because if you were in the bottoms in Kansas City between 1900 and 19, you know, almost 50-something, that's all you heard was those cows and those pigs going off continually um, because there were 600-some-odd acres of them. Um, so it was a lot of noise. And I just want that ambience of that cow and pig noise uh, filling the room so that you get the feeling that you really are down in the bottoms. Um, I don't know how long I've talked, but got to be getting close to questions, I would hope, as I'm running out of stuff to talk about. Um, I did want to talk about the bad and the ugly, and I'll do that real quick. Uh, I have two big problems in this railroad um, that I should have known better about, but I didn't. And so we're going to do something about it here before too long. Let's see if I can tilt this camera down and give you an idea. You know, quieten that noise down a bit. There we go. There, you can see that this roadway, if I get it focused, um, this roadway is terrible. It has warped. It's gone absolutely crazy on me. Uh, up here, I have this sidewalks totally coming up. This one is totally warped. I couldn't run a train through there if I wanted to. And that was all done because I used goo, Walter's goo, to hold down uh, my street. That was a big mistake. I did it because of all this unevenness along here, trying to glue to the rocks. But in actuality, goo has all those aromatic solvents in it, and it attacked the styrene, which I use for my roads. Um, I love styrene for roads, but nonetheless, I should have found something else. So again, I have, and that is Wood and Scenic uh, Hobby Tack. Um, I put another road down that's on the far end down that way, and um, it's working great. So is the road across the street. It's here. Let me get my camera to loosen up. The roadway over here is down and tight and shows no signs of the warping that I got from um, 
using the goo. That's all down with double stick tape. The other problem I have, and this one's going to be really hard to show because of the nature of it, but I'm going to darken you way down because this has to do with my lights <laughs> of all things. I think you can see there in between my plastic, I've, I've used cracked ice, which is available from the hardware store to diffuse my um, lights overhead. Now, one thing I always like to do, whether I was doing the um, Colorado railroads or open you up here again, or even here in Kansas City, is I wanted to. There we go. That's not bad. I wanted to do the cyclorama. That's where this wall, which is coming in straight here, and this is another wall that comes back at 90 degrees, and then the ceiling comes in. This is a con compound corner up here and this corner here is curved and it's curved to the ceiling and it's curved in the compound I just want to get the feeling that that sky is bending forever and the only way to really light a psychorama correctly is if you have indirect lighting up on top if I were to put a light bulb here it would cast a shadow and you'd have a line right along my psych here and it would destroy that uh, wrapped ceiling so I went for the um, diffusion up here and my problem with that became that they're trying to fall down i cut them wide enough but they're still trying to come down so at each joint i've cut them in and i've taken coat hangers and i put coat hanger wires uh, you can probably see them in there and there and there and that has solved my problem but uh, just so you don't think that this railroad came off without a hitch and without a problem um, we've had some problems that have been me extremely menacing had to solve it so at any rate am i off already i have no idea what uh, time it is <laughs> it is nice did i miss questions or nobody had any actually we got a couple um Good. Okay. One of which was, what is the name of okay. the UK decoder that you were talking about? I'm Del Tang. D E L T A N G. All right. And you said on one of the, on your one. And that's sold. Go ahead. Okay, yeah, we got a terrible lag, so I'm sorry. I don't want to talk over you. Deltang is sold by the ON30 guy, G-U-I. And if you type in on your browser, ON30 guy, he'll come up. It's Mortensen is his name. Um, and if he's not selling him right now actively, I'm, I'm not sure what the status is with, with him. Uh, but he did sell him. I think you can also buy him directly off of uh, Amazon. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, they're absolutely fantastic decoders. They really are. Motor control is great. Uh, and Miles, I don't know if you mentioned it, but when did you start construction on this layout? Uh, I moved into this house about 10 years ago, and I started, give or take, about eight years ago. Uh, we what? were actually still building model railroads commercially at the time I moved in. So this is my construction room. And as soon as we delivered the last layout out of here, then I started the railroad. All right. And um, one of the things is, is somebody asked, they said that they believe that your layout is ON30. I know you mentioned it earlier. Yes, it is. It's ON30. Okay. And how, I know you were talking about the warpage of the road. So what are you planning on doing to fix that? Or do you, have you not come across an idea yet? Well, the only way to fix it is to take it totally out. I'll rebuild those um, sections of the railroad that are warped and looking bad and then glue them back down again. But this time I'll use the wooden scenics hobby tack 
instead of the goo. But really, once that plastic is that warped and the glue is the goo gone, is, or the goo is still on the back side of it, you're not going to get rid of that outgassing without just throwing them away and starting again. So that's why it hasn't been done yet. It's another one of my projects that needs to be done. All right. And that appears to be the end of the questions that we have. Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, we actually do have one Thank new you. question. It is, how do you control your turnouts? Um, they're all controlled by Intuit switches. There's a man here in town who's 90 plus. He's a retired electrical engineer. And I don't know if you can see him back here behind me. This is one. Um, they stick on the fascia. They have a little micro circuit on here. And it, I don't know if you can see it change or not, but it changes to green on the normal route or on the reverse. And um, I'm using um, tortoise switch machines. Uh, to actually do the throwing, but the Intuit switches are uh, my controls out on the front of the layout. And I've matched, there's a graphic on the front of that that you can buy any configuration and he will custom make configurations for you um, and you can control them. Um, absolutely fantastic controller, not just because he's in Kansas City, but because it gives you a graphic, it gives you control, it gives you everything. And I'd, I'd support any model railroader who's 90 and still thinking enough to be able to do this kind of stuff. Uh, he's he's yeah. he's a pretty he's a pretty amazing model railroader. His his mind is way ahead of most of us. <laughs> 